late 1990s, George Lucas announced that he was going to release a set of three movies that were to be a prequel to Star Wars. Up to this time, we'd had episode four, five, and six, which we didn't know were four, five, and six. We knew they were the first, the second, and the third. And, uh, but George Lucas said, I'm going to do a prequel, and the focus of Star Wars prequel would be on Luke Skywalker's dad, Anakin Skywalker. So in 1999, he released The Phantom Menace, which is honestly on my personal list of least favorite Star Wars movies. It's not good, um, but uh, the, the episode two is worse, so uh, just, you know... I'm not telling you, but I am going to, if you don't know about Star Wars, I'm going to ruin something for you right now, okay? I feel like in our culture, if you don't know this in the last 23 years, uh, that it's okay. Like, it's okay to ruin it. So, uh, Luke Skywalker, the main character in episodes four, five, and six, his dad is Anakin Skywalker, who becomes Darth Vader, the infamous and awful Darth Vader. So when you go back and watch episode one, two, and three, which is focused on Anakin, you know what's coming. You know that Anakin is going to become the evil Darth Vader, that the Galactic Republic is going to fall and become the Galactic Empire. And so there's this sense of ominous foreboding as you watch it. Not only are the movies not good, but you know that it ends badly. It just, it's just going to end awful. And in all that sense, it's like watching a train wreck in slow motion. The inevitable is going to happen. When we get to the book of Jeremiah, Jeremiah is in every sense a tragedy. Like the Star Wars prequels, Jeremiah was an Old Testament prophet who was ministering during the final years before Jerusalem falls to Babylon and the nation is destroyed. And so when we're reading Jeremiah, Jeremiah is a prophet during this time, and everything he's telling them that is going to happen, happens. So Jeremiah says, listen up, people. God is going to bring judgment on his people for wholeheartedly and repeatedly being unfaithful to him. God has tried everything to bring you back to him, and you won't listen. So the end of your nation is coming. And then, like watching this train wreck in slow motion, we read 52 chapters about this. Jeremiah is, in every sense of the word, a tragedy. And here in our Bible, we see Jeremiah, who is tasked with the job of proclaiming this message to people and this is not a message anyone wants to hear it's like this guy holding up the sign you know that says uh the end is near nobody likes this guy this is not your friend that you want to buddy up with nobody likes this guy yet this is jeremiah 52 chapters of this the longest book in the old testament by words, if you did a word count, Jeremiah is the longest one. So you might be thinking, Dave, why on earth would you want to spend 20 weeks? Like this is depressed. Everyone is going to go home depressed every week. No one is going to come back, Dave. Well, here's why, because I think there's a lot of hope in Jeremiah if we understand what's happening. Um, Mike Wagner, my friend uh, uh, who attends church here, Mike preaches from time to time, and uh, Mike uh, is just a keen mind, a love for Scripture. And I was, he was asking me, what's next? After we finished up our, uh, our Galatians series, then we were in Psalms for the summer, and we, we did our four-week series on Live Like Jesus. And, and he's like, what's next? And I said, well, I, I'm not sure. He goes, uh, well, how do you choose what's next? And I said, well, I usually try to balance the genres of Scripture. So we're not just in the Gospels, or we're not just in Paul's epistles, but we're balancing our look at scriptures through the whole counsel of God's word. And so he was, uh, so I, keep, I said, I keep track. I showed him, like, you know, and he goes, well, you've never preached from a major prophet before. And he says, how come? And I said, because I don't want to. <laughs> like, <laughs> 
Like, this is scary and awful, and I, I don't want to sit up here and tell you guys every week, you stink, and let me just tell you another way, you stink. And so uh, Mike just chuckled, and in his chuckle, I took a challenge, and I'm like, we're going to do it. We are going to jump into Jeremiah together. And so that's how we uh, landed here. Now, this is going to be harder, but as I begin to study Jeremiah, I begin to see there's this rich rich message of God's character. And in spite of his disciplining his people, he is a faithful God. And so over these 20 or some weeks that we're going to do this split into two parts, uh, I hope that you will develop a deep love for the faithfulness of God and the mercy that we have in Jesus Christ. If we had a theme verse for the book, it would be Jeremiah Chapter 1, verse 10, I'll put it up here, but if you're on your scripture journal, just open to, the, to Jeremiah 1 and the second page there, uh, page 8, and uh, in verse uh, 10, you'll see this. Uh, God, God says to Jeremiah, see, I have pointed you today over nations and kingdoms to uproot and tear down, to build and to replant. This charge in the ESV, it actually says to pluck up. That's the same thing as uproot. And then he says the word plant, replant there. Uh, This charge that God gives to Jeremiah in Jeremiah chapter 1 really becomes the theme for the whole book. This concept of uh, pluck up or uproot, it comes up over and over and over again in Jeremiah. And you really, we can see this as we develop and dig into the book, that this is the idea God is uprooting and he's replanting. And so the, really the first part of the book we're going to focus on is the uprooting part. We're going to talk about some difficult things. In this series, you're going to be challenged to know the radical love of God for us, his people. God's love is not oversimplistic. He's not your grandpa who pats you on the head and sends you on your way after you trudge through his garden and tore up all his precious vegetables. And he goes, oh, it's fine, and heads you on your... God is more complex. His love is deeper. God is more faithful than that. He's faithful enough to love and to discipline. And sometimes that means he uproots. But even in the midst of discipline, there is always, always hope. So God also replants. He is faithful and loving. So today, I want to introduce you to the world of Jeremiah. And this is going to be a little different today. I need your mind to engage. I need you to not fall asleep, so get some more coffee if you need to, because I have to transport you 2,500 years into the past so we can understand the world of Jeremiah. And this message is foundational for understanding everything we're going to do and look at as we work through Jeremiah. And so hang in here, stay awake as we uh, transport to the past. So that's the very first point I want to talk about today is simply this, the world of Jeremiah. If you grabbed one of those outlines, you're going to need this as I talk. You see this little thing that says historical events? This will help you keep track of what I'm going to do in the next few minutes as I introduce you to Jeremiah's world. To understand Jeremiah's world, you have we have to really look back about a hundred years before Jeremiah. Um, About 100 years before Jeremiah, we see God's people split into two sister nations. You have the northern kingdom of Israel, which was referred to as the ten tribes, and the southern kingdom of Israel, which is referred to by the largest tribe in that, the tribe of Judah. And so we'll often talk about the king of Israel and the king of Judah being the northern nation Israel, the southern nation by their largest tribe, Judah. Now, These two sister nations at at the time leading up to Jeremiah are sandwiched in a global geopolitical conflict. There are two superpowers that exist 100 years before Jeremiah. To the northeast, they have this world superpower called Assyria. You might remember the book of Jonah. Jonah goes to Nineveh because Jonah hates the Ninevites, which are Assyrians. It's the capital of Assyria. He doesn't want to talk to them. Down to the southwest, we have this global emerging superpower of Egypt who has come back together and has developed a vast army. And these two nations are sort of in conflict and literally geographically 
Israel and Judah are right in the middle. And so in 722, Assyria comes down from the north, comes to the capital of the north, which is Samaria, and they sack it and they kill everybody. They scatter the people and they destroy the northern kingdom. And so now the southern kingdom of Judah under king, a king by the name of Hezekiah is praying to God because Assyria comes down and knocks on the door of Jerusalem. And through a miracle of God, the army of Assyria is thrown into disarray and they disappear. And so we have now a sisterless nation in Judah. It was a tiny, insignificant nation sitting between two giant world superpowers, Egypt and Assyria. Um, in, the long, in the long wait from Hezekiah through several kings till we get to uh, the king we're going to talk about today, Josiah, um, there are several kings, but one king in particular, Hezekiah's son, after Hezekiah dies, a guy by the name of Manasseh comes to power. And he reigns for 50 years. And Manasseh is known as one of the most evil kings in Judah's history. Manasseh experiences an incredible um, oppression, a lot of pressure from Assyria. Assyria said, hey, we didn't wipe you out when we came down in 722, so, but we could at any time. So if you don't pay us tribute, give us money, they put an incredible taxing burden on him, and you must also accept our gods. Well, for an Israelite, hero Israel, the Lord is one, there's only one God. This was unthinkable. But Manasseh bowed to the pressure. He set up pagan altars all over the land of Judah. He encouraged people. He set up towns for pagan priests. He encouraged people to worship the pagan gods. Just throw them in with your worship of the one true God, Yahweh, he said. And the nation went, and not only this, uh, Manasseh encouraged awful behavior. He encouraged black arts, magic, sorcery, witchcraft, divination. Manasseh, as a tribute to a pagan god, took his firstborn son and slaughtered him on the altar. To appease a pagan god. And he encouraged other people to do the same. Manasseh reigned for 50 years. And Judah was a very dark place. If you lived in the kingdom of Judah at this time. You might hear that you know your neighbors Fred and Nancy. Let's call them. They uh, sacrificed their oldest son on the altar to a pagan god. And you might be a little troubled by that, but you'd probably go, well, we've been doing this for 50 years, and as long as I can remember, that's what people did. So that's probably a good thing that they did that. The culture had completely moved away from Yahweh. God's people were no longer his, and it was dark. And as for long as, as anyone could remember, for 50 years it had been like this. In Manasseh's last few months of his reign, God got a hold of his heart. He finally repented, but it was too late. The damage was done. The nation had experienced a total abandonment of God. So when Manasseh died, his son reigned for a very, very short time, an insignificant time. But to this dark, dark world, Two boys, two young boys were born to bring God's hope back to his people. And their names were Josiah, who would be king, and Jeremiah, who would be prophet. And Jer Josiah was born three years, and three years after his grandfather Manasseh died, Josiah became king. He was eight years old when he became king. Eight, can you imagine an eight-year-old being king of a nation? That was Josiah. He was eight years old. And I think, as a teenager, we, the scriptures recount that Josiah began to follow the one true God early in his teenage years. And I think, I can't prove this, 
Tank, Pastor Tank and I were talking about this uh, this week. I think Josiah looked back and he remembers as a five or six year old boy, his grandpa Manasseh repenting and turning back to the one true God. And I think as a teenager, when he started to develop influence and power as king, he said, we as a nation are need to go back to the worship of God. The people of Judah needed to return to the people that they were, to what he called. And Josiah began to lead the nation in the repentance that his grandfather had started late in his life. When uh, Jeremiah was born not too long after Josiah, and uh, maybe slightly younger than Josiah, the second gift of a baby boy that was given to this nation was the prophet Jeremiah. When he was just probably in his teens, he experienced God's call to be a prophet. We're going to look at this passage in chapter 1. And uh, you understand that he was, he was younger, but Jeremiah, the text says, right away in chapter 1, verse 1, it tells us where he was born. It says, these are the words of Jeremiah, son of Hilkiah, one of the priests who were in Anathoth in the land of Benjamin. A Anathoth didn't have real godly priests. It had pagan priests. Jeremiah's dad was a priest for a pagan re religion that had infiltrated the land. And in this, God calls him, and he grabs him out of it. And as a teenager, God called him, and he began to deliver a message of repentance to the people of Judah. And Jeremiah began to prophesy, calling them to return to God and warning them about a bleak future. Now, an important thing happened a ways after Jeremiah, a few years after Jeremiah started prophesying, and, and Josiah started to have his own personal revival, a couple really important things happened. Uh, first of all, um, Josiah it had this personal revival, and he began to tear down the pagan altars. Now, remember where those pagan altars came from. They came from Assyria. Manasseh bowed to the pressure of Assyria. And so when Josiah began to tear them down, the reason he could do this is because something really important happened on the geopolitical in the world history. Assyria started to have an internal conflict. The Chaldeans, or Babylonians as they will be called, were a small group within their empire, and the Babylonians started to rebel. They had insurrection against Assyria. Assyria had more important things to worry about than this tiny, backwards, out-of-the-way nation of Judah. And so they sort of let uh, Josiah do whatever he wanted to do because they were dealing with their internal stuff. And so this set the stage for Josiah to be free to tear down pagan altars and then to rebuild the temple of God. And as he's refinishing and, and fixing all the things that were broken in the temple of God, as he's bringing it back to, to restoring it, they discover in this temple something really important, the book of the law. This is how far God's people had gotten from them. They had tucked away the book of the law, which is probably the first five books of the Old Testament, which is vital for any Jew who wants to follow God. They had taken this, and it was so not important, they'd shoved it in storage, the scrolls in storage somewhere, and forgotten about it. This is how far these people are from God. They rediscover it. Josiah has it read in front of all the people and he begins this impetus to have revival back to the one true God. And so Jeremiah, sanctioned by now by Josiah, goes into the, the land and begins to preach this message of repentance. And even though his ministry, though, was sanctioned by the king, Jeremiah did not have it easy. Satan was going to fight Jeremiah. Jeremiah experienced severe persecution, even wanting to quit. Now, the first 18, 18 years or so of Jeremiah's ministry are during the reign of Josiah. Pagans aren't letting go easily. Jeremiah preaches the message in the streets, and he was branded a traitor by his own hometown. In fact, in, if you flip, though, you don't have to flip there now. I'll read it to you. But in Jeremiah 15, verse 17, he's complaint, Jeremiah's complaining to God about this. He says, I sat alone because your hand was upon me, God. <laughs> we know a little else about what happened in this time 
But Jeremiah felt this incredible persecution because Satan didn't want to let go of this people. In the year 609 B.C., if you're looking at your outline there, you'll see that uh, a couple important things happen in 609. Um, Assyria is in this internal conflict with the Chaldeans. It's not going well. And so Assyria calls out to Egypt for help. That's weird because they were enemies, but uh, Egypt says, I'll come help you, Assyrians, if you give me the land of Palestine, where the, the, the whole thing, where Syria and where uh, Israel, modern-day Israel, all that whole area. And so Egypt, uh, Assyria agrees, yes, come bail us out. So Egypt comes marching through the land of Judah on their way to go help the Assyrians. For Josiah, this is a terrible news. Because Josiah has had freedom to pursue the worship of Yahweh. And if Assyria regains control, Josiah knows he's going to not be able to do this anymore. So Josiah doesn't see an option. He goes out and he gathers his small army and he meets the Egyptians in battle to stop them from going to Assyria. And they just decimate Josiah. And Josiah dies. Uh, this is a massive turning point in the book of Jeremiah. Josiah's death, the re remaining elders, the leaders of Jerusalem, they shoot, hand select his son, which son they want to be king, and they, they pick him out of order. They pick the youngest son. His name is, is Shalom, or uh, you, you can see different, all these kings have different names, and you'll see them in there. Uh, they, they rename him Jehoahaz, but they pick his youngest son, Shalom, and they bring him up, and they say, you're going to be king. And I think the elders of Judah knew that, of Israel, they knew that, that they could control him. Uh, well, Egypt uh, doesn't completely defeat Assyria, but on the way back, they establish their presence in Jerusalem. And they go, after three months, you can see that, and they're like, we don't like the Shalom, the Jehoahaz person. We're going to pick a different son of Josiah and put him on the throne. And so this is where Jehoiakim, if you're looking in your outline there, you'll see his name. He is the primary adversary of Jeremiah during the book of Jeremiah, this king. So now Jeremiah no longer has political protection to preach God's message. Jehoiakim does not appreciate Jeremiah because Jeremiah says bad things. He says, stop worshiping pagan deities. And Jehoiakim goes, well, I'm kind of like, I, I got to do now whatever Egypt tells me to do because they're in charge around here now. And he does not like Jeremiah. Much of the writing that we have in the book of Jeremiah occurs, occurs in this period of these kings. Jehoiakim, Jehoiachin, <laughs> good luck keeping those separate. I will try to help you as we walk along. And the last king, Zedekiah. Babylon would eventually defeat Assyria. And then they come knocking on the door of Jerusalem. By this time, a guy named Zedekiah is king. And Babylon totally destroys Jerusalem. They knock its walls to the ground. They pillage everything in the city. They knock the stone. They destroy the temple. Anything of value, they take back to Babylon with them. And they leave the nation of Judah in shambles. They assassinate people left and right. So there is just a tiny fraction of, of the nation of Judah left, and, they, and Babylon takes them into exile. This is the world that Jeremiah is preaching to. And I tell you, it's somber because it is. This is not a happy-go-lucky, wow, this is going to end great story. But in here we see, through the pages of Jeremiah, a faithful God. And Jeremiah understands that he is going to be faithful to God no matter what comes his way. These kings of Judah, these last kings before they're utterly destroyed, they don't like Jeremiah. They throw him in stocks in the public square. At one point, he gets imprisoned. He's put under house arrest. He's even thrown in a pit in the ground that has just enough dried out water that there's clay in the bottom, and his legs sink into the clay, and this old man is stuck in the bottom. Like, it didn't go well for Jeremiah. In fact, Jeremiah complains for the, he, in chapter 20, 
verse 9, he says, For the word of the Lord has become for me a reproach and derision all day long. If I say, I will not mention God or speak any more in his name, there is in my heart, as it were, a burning fire shut up in my bones. I am weary of holding it in. Indeed, I cannot. <laughs> Jeremiah's like, I don't want to talk to you about you anymore, God. Because it only gets me in trouble. I'm just going to keep my mouth shut. But he can't contain it. The word is in, in his heart like a fire. Eventually, Josiah's last son, Zedekiah, becomes king. Jerusalem is burned to the ground. And that's where we're left in, in chapter 52. Now, uh, so that you don't despair completely, the last chapter 52 gives us this glimmer of hope. This glimmer of hope that something good is coming. And that's what we're left with in Jeremiah. That is the world in which Jeremiah lived. He ministered under five different kings and one Babylonian governor. He ministered when the Assyrians were in power, when the Egyptians were in power, and when the Babylonians were in power. In the 40-some years that he ministered to the people of Judah, he saw all kinds of change, and nevertheless, he was faithful to God. All right. Here is this history lesson. The next thing that we need to know as we dig into Jeremiah, we need to understand how this book is put together. Because when I read a book, I open the book, and I assume when I'm reading a book that the first thing I need to know is in the first chapter. The next thing that happens is in the second chapter. The next thing that happens is in the third. I assume I'm walking through the book, and by the end, I get to the end. Well, we have the first thing in chapter 1, and we have the last thing in chapter 52. But everything in between is complete chaos. It is not organized in chronological fashion. It is a mass of different writings, just like the Psalms. When you read Psalms, you go, oh, okay, I can see this Psalm is different than this Psalm is different than this Psalm. We have that in Jeremiah. It's a collection of collections of Jeremiah's writing. And to make everything more difficult, in chapter 36, God tells Jeremiah, he says, write down everything I've told you. To this point, for decades, Jeremiah has just been preaching whatever God said to him to say. Now, he's got to write it down. So he gets a scribe by the name of Baruch. It's very important to Jeremiah. They're buddies. And Jeremiah dictates and Baruch writes it all down. I don't know how long it took them, those two, to write down all the words of Jeremiah. God says, make sure that these scrolls are read in front of Je King Jehoiakim. So this massive work that Jeremiah and Baruch put together, they read it in the public square, which gets them in a lot of trouble, and then it's taken and it's read to King Jehoiakim. And Ev Jeho you can just see Jehoiakim brooding in his castle lair, I don't know what you call it, his, uh, next to the fire. And as a section of the scroll is read. He stops the guy reading it. He takes out his knife. He cuts the scroll, that part off, and he puts it in the fire. And this whole work, piece by piece, is burned in the fire. So in chapter 36, God tells Jeremiah, write it all down again. <laughs> so they write it all down again. And it says Baruch wrote down other things that Jeremiah had said. So this whole thing gets collected, whether it was Baruch that put all these together in this book of Jeremiah or with God inspired someone else to do that. We don't, I don't really know, but the, what we have here is a series of writings of Jeremiah that are not necessarily in any order. So this is why I gave you this little chart here that lists all the kings, because when you can read Jeremiah, you read a king and you go, okay, I know what was basically happening during this time of Jeremiah's writing. And you, I think, listen, I, I've read a lot about Jeremiah, and no one agrees how to split this thing up. So uh, I finally came to a conclusion that these three points in your outline describe basically what's happening in each section of Jeremiah. The first section is uh, weeds in the garden. And this is uh, like you're going out to your garden and you're plucking weeds, right? Jeremiah is out and he's pointing out here are all the weeds that need to be plucked. The second section is, generally speaking, 
more historical narrative. And this is where God is saying to Jeremiah, through Jeremiah rather, there is hope. I am going to replant this garden that has been plucked up. The third section is God delivering a message through Jeremiah to other nations other than Judah. And God is saying, I'm the gardener of the whole world because he loves the whole world, not just one tiny nation. This is generally how we can break up and look at the book of Jeremiah. Now, the last thing, I, the third thing I want to do today, um, very quickly, is I want to read the text of Jeremiah chapter 1 to you and just talk about it a little bit, just really quick. Um, we see in chapter uh, 1, 1, we see the words of Jeremiah. Just look along with me here. The son of Hilkiah, I already mentioned he's a pagan priest, one of the priests who were in Anathoth in the land of ben Benjamin, to whom the word of the Lord came in the days of Josiah, the son of Ammon, king of Judah, in the 13th year of his reign. It, also, it came also in the days of Jehoiakim, the son of Josiah, king of Judah, and until the end of the 11th year of Zedekiah. He's just mentioned three major kings. There were two other kings in there that only reigned for three months apiece, and so Jeremiah doesn't even write those down because they're just really brief. But we see these five kings, these three major ones here. Now, verse 4. Now the word of the Lord came to me, Jeremiah says, saying, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I consecrated you. I appointed you a prophet to the nations. Jeremiah's calling is based on God's direction. God formed him. God knew him in the womb. God put Jeremiah together. And before Jeremiah, while that it was even in process of God was building and developing Jeremiah physically, he said, I had a purpose and intention for you. Your life has direction and meaning. But Jeremiah, verse 6, he says, Oh, Lord God, behold, I don't know how to speak, for I am only a youth. I think he was probably a teenager. Uh, I mean, who's going to listen to me? Jeremiah's inadequacies, though, are nothing to God's power. The Lord said to me, verse 7, Don't say I'm only a youth, for to all to whom I send you, you shall go. And whatever I command you, you shall speak. Don't be afraid of them, for I am with you to deliver you, declares the Lord. See, Jeremiah's inadequacies as a, not an eloquent speaker or someone who's not respected. God says, I don't care. My power is sufficient for you. Look to, skip over to verse 11 for a second. The word of the Lord came to me saying, Jeremiah, what do you see? And I said, well, I see an almond branch. And the Lord said to me, you've seen well, for I am watching over my word to perform it. God's going to give Jeremiah two illustrations to encourage him to go and speak. The first one is an almond branch. Now, like, we don't really know what that is uh, typically, but in the ancient world, the almond branch was the first one to blossom in the spring. And it sounds, it's a play on words here, it sounds like the Hebrew word for watching. Almond branch and watching sound very similar. And what God is saying to Jeremiah is, listen, just like you watch, if you're looking for spring, because, you know, we know February is coming. And like, we will be anxious for spring. I don't know if you, in my backyard, I know pretty much which trees blossom first. I'm looking at them. When are they going to blossom? So you looked at the almond branch, if you wanted to know. And God says, just like you're watching the almond branch, I'm watching. He says, I, I'm watching over my word to perform it. He gives him another illustration, uh, 13. The word of the Lord came to me a second time saying, what do you see? And I said, I see a boiling pot facing away from the north. Okay, imagine a pot. If you put a pot over a campfire and you tilt it towards the north, when it boils, what's going to happen to the water? It's going to boil over and boil out. And God says, I see a boiling pot facing away. Then the Lord answered me, verse 14, out of the north, that's where the Babylonians would eventually come from, out of the north, disaster shall be let loose upon all the inhabitants of the land. For behold, I am calling all the tribes of the kingdoms of the north, declares the Lord, and they shall come. And every one shall set his throne at the entrance of the gates of Jerusalem against all its walls and all around and against all the cities of Judah. God's message is his. It's not Jeremiah's message. 
It's his God is the one watching. God is the one setting the boiling pot. God is organizing things, and Jeremiah's job is just to proclaim it. He says, verse 17, But you, dress yourself for work. Arise, say to them everything that I command you. Don't be dismayed by them, lest I dismay you before them. And I, behold, I will make you this day a fortified city, an iron pill, pillar, bronze walls against the whole land, against the kings of Judah, its officials, its priests, and the people of the land. They will fight against you, but they will not prevail against you, for I am with you, declares the Lord. I will deliver you. God does not promise Jeremiah an easy road. He does not say, hey, don't worry about it. Nothing's going to affect you. You're going to cruise. You just say what I have, and I'll make it great for you. No, God says to Jeremiah, I will fortify you. You will undergo the attacks for saying my words, but I am with you. I have not left you, and I will not abandon you. Do you see the faithfulness of God even in the midst of the difficult times that Jeremiah is going to face? This is the calling of Jeremiah. The last thing I want to talk today is about the purpose of Jeremiah. We've looked at the world of Jeremiah, the book of Jeremiah, the calling of Jeremiah, and now I want to briefly just look at the purpose, and that's why I skipped verses 9 and 10. Go back. Verse 9, Then the Lord put out his hand and touched my mouth, and the Lord said to me, Behold, I have put my words in your mouth. See, I have set you this day over nations and over kingdoms to pluck up or uproot and to break down, to destroy and to overthrow, to build and to plant. God is calling Jeremiah, and the theme of his book is that God is a God who uproots when he needs to discipline but he always replants. There's hope in this passage. Now, you might ask, well, why did everything go so badly? I mean, we, we look at this book of Jeremiah, and it's depressing and, and hard and difficult, but uh, we are going to work through this, and in the depressing and hard times, we're going to see God's faithfulness. But in this, why, why would God do this? Why does it go so badly? Oh, as we read in Jeremiah, there's more going on here than God just going, I told you so, or Jeremiah, look, I told you it happened, and it happened. There's more going on there than that. God's full sovereignty is on display. He cares deeply for his people, but he knows that gardening must be done. God is a God who loves his people enough to discipline them. Um, it's interesting, the gardening that is a metaphor that occurs over and over in Scripture. You remember back in the Garden of Eden, God established Adam and Eve, and he gave them the job to watch over the garden. Of course, they said, God, uh, we don't really care what you want. We're going to do it our own way. And that went really bad for them. We end the story of the Bible with a city garden where there are fruit trees, the same tree of life that we started with. And the people dwell in the presence of the master gardener, God. You see, God's always gardening. He's always gardening. He's disciplining when he needs to. He's uprooting when he needs to. And he replants because there is always hope. So like Star Wars, is this a tragedy in the making? Well, yes, Jerusalem is going to be destroyed. But no, because there's hope. Is God done with his people? No. Chapters 30 to 33, in the middle, right in the center of your, of your book of Jeremiah, there are these beautiful chapters of hope, of God saying to Jeremiah, I am going to have a new covenant with you. We learn from Jeremiah, if we look carefully, if we see this through the lens of the whole Bible, we learn from Jeremiah that we need to love the gospel more. Because, see, God had given his law to the people, but Jeremiah is going to recount over in his book that the people are unable to follow God's laws. They just can't do it. No matter how hard they try, we have hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years of them proving that just having the law is not enough. Because eventually they take it and they tuck it away and say, we don't care anymore. Jeremiah chapter 31, God says this to Jeremiah. Behold, he says, I'm going to make a new covenant with the people. 
a new agreement. This time, instead of writing my law in the book, I'm going to write it in their hearts. It's this foreshadowing to the Holy Spirit coming, where God's people now are his temple, and God through his Spirit lives in them. See, for us on this side of the cross, we understand for those who have placed their faith in Jesus Christ here today, if you are a Christian, if you say, I'm following the ways and teachings of Jesus, and I accept that his blood was shed on my behalf, for those of us who have done that, more has happened than a simple transactional forgiveness. More is going on there. God is writing his righteousness in you that you don't deserve. So you and I know that if you try harder, it just doesn't work. If anything, when we look at Jeremiah through the lens of the gospel, it, it, we should look and go, oh, I see myself in these people. I mean, I see myself all over here. But, but the answer is not try harder. The answer is not shape up and be better. The answer is not also ignore this. You can't just go, well, Jeremiah's in the Old Testament. I don't know what to do with the Old Testament. So we'll just throw it out and only read the New Testament. That is heresy. God gave us this for a reason. We have to look at it through the lens of the cross of Jesus Christ and see that what they could not do has been ascribed to us in Christ. The right, Jesus did it perfectly, and we get credit for his righteousness. So we see it through the lens of the gospel. So this is the introduction to Jeremiah. Uh, every, everything that I, I said, there's a lot of heady stuff going on here today. Everything I'm talking about will set the framework. But as we read Jeremiah together, in the most depressing times we look at this through Jesus. We look at this through the gospel. And we see our depravity in the people, but we see our righteousness in Christ. Because Jesus paid it all. You don't pay. Jesus paid it all. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I'm so excited to be challenged by this difficult book of Scripture. God, as your people... Lord, would you help us to engage our minds with your word, engage our hearts, God, with uh, your truth, and allow the Holy Spirit in us to see all the precious things we have in Christ, the forgiveness that we have. We commit to you again as the people of God to bathe ourselves in the blood of Jesus, finding full forgiveness. We commit ourselves to this. In Jesus' name, amen.